Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at quadratic forms. So remember, quadratic form is where I take a vector, multiply a symmetric matrix, and then multiply uh, with the, the same vector on the other side. Now, when, so remember, it's going to be the vector transpose, matrix, vector in the multiplication. The vector is a random variable, while the matrix is symmetric and constant. Okay, so what we want to do, we want to really dig into this because this gives us a lot more powerful uh, ways to approach uh, distributions. All right, so let, let's look at an example. So what we're going to do, we're going to take something that we're familiar with, you know, that we've grown up with in statistics, and then we're going to uh, look at a version of it that uses quadratic forms. By doing it this way, we all the properties of quadratic forms can be applied to the very familiar aspect of statistics. So let's go ahead, take, go ahead and take the sum of squared, variable, uh, squared observations. All right, well, you know, so we're, we're real familiar with this, right? We, we've been dealing with this kind of thing for a long time in our stat theory and whatever, uh, calculating variance in introductory statistics, stuff like that. Okay, well, here's what we're gonna do. I want to uh, change this into another format. And uh, so let's go ahead, let's do this. Let's go ahead and add and subtract the mean. So something typical from stat theory. Now I'm gonna go ahead and square this, remember? So here, it's like I have a parenthesis around the y sub i, and then I add, subtract inside that parenthesis. Now I square. So I'm using the college algebra squaring formula. Now what I'm going to do, remember it's a summation, you know, it's sum of squared items. So I'm going to go ahead and distribute the sum so here we're taking, we're applying all the operations to each of these guys with respect to the index. The difference here is effectively that I'm changing the order of the addition. That's all, the only thing that has changed. Now you'll notice that here we get y sub i minus y bar squared, all right, sum of squares, right? And then here, when I distribute the summation to this part, well two and y bar are considered constants because I'm summing with respect to i. Since I'm summing with respect to i, there's no i in the y bar because that operation has been completed at that point. So the summation goes into here. Okay, now, and then I add up y bar squared. Well, y bar is a constant, right? So when I add it all up, it's gonna be n times the constant. All right, well now what if I take the, uh, the sum of the observations minus the mean. What is that going to be? Hopefully you remember, it's going to be zero every single time. All right, so if I look at this, the sum of squared observations is equal to uh, the sum of squares, deviation from the mean, plus n times y bar squared. I can rewrite this. All I'm doing is just moving this part over here effectively. We can see that the uh, sum of squared deviation from the sample mean is equal to the sum of observations squared minus n times y bar squared. If we're familiar with this, you know, you know, from working with this in our uh, introductory statistics class. All right, now what we want to do this time, we want to get a quadratic form for this instead. All right, because we're gonna learn some properties about quadratic forms and we would like to be able to apply that knowledge. That way we could use this in, uh, in other aspects. Okay, well, if, let's think about this. If I have the sum of observations squared, is that the same as the dot product on the y vector? Yes, it is. Okay, so here, yeah, I've got y transpose y. Now, remember the identity matrix doesn't change anything. So when it comes to matrix multiplication, I can always insert an i anywhere I want as long as it's you know, under multiplication. So if I put an i in between, that's okay. So I can see that the quadratic form of the sum of squared observations is gonna be a y transpose i y. All right, now let's go ahead and let's do another one, another example. Let's go ahead and first let's recall that the j vector is the vector of all ones and the j matrix is the matrix of all ones. And so, and another thing to remember is that I can get this 
matrix by multiplying J times J transpose. So, why is it? so J is equal to J times J transpose. The capital J, matrix J, is equal to vector J times vector J transpose. Okay, so if I think about Y bar, Y bar is just one over N times the sum of Y's, right? All right, well, is there another way to write that? Well, here, if I was to rewrite the summation as transpose J times Y, that's the same as the summation, right? And so then what I can do is I can go ahead and you know, just write it in this way. Now, if I think about N times Y bar squared, because we're going in a very specific direction with this, if I think about N times Y bar squared, well, that's uh, the constant vector Y times the constant vector Y, you know, transpose times the vector. And then there's an N on there. Well, oh, and I need to divide by N when I do this. Okay, so if I think about this, if I take the vector of all the Y's and add them up, then divide by N, that's really close to what I've got here. I just don't have the squaring part. So if I multiply the same thing by itself, then I'm going to get this part here. Okay. Now in this format, I see I've got a scalar. I see I've got a scalar. I, can, I want to factor this out. Now it's okay for the transpose because when it comes to scalar factorization, transpose doesn't in, impact anything. So I can pull both of these 1 over n's out. So I have n, 1 over n squared coming from here. And now on this part, I've got a transpose. Remember, if I have transpose on the big parenthesis, I can switch the order and apply the transpose to each individual part. So I take Y transpose, J transpose transpose, which is J. Over here, I get J transpose, stays the same, and this stays the same. Okay, well now I remember that J times J transpose is capital J. So now I get one over N times transpose Y, capital, or capital J, and then Y, and I can go ahead and rewrite this, distribute that into the J. I have Y transpose, one over N J, and then Y. All right, so now I have a quadratic form for, uh, for Y bar and for N times Y bar squared. Okay, well, let's keep on going with this. All right, so we've established a moment ago that this, the sum of square deviation from the mean, look up here, the sum of square deviations is equal to the sum of squared observations minus n times y bar squared. So if I take this formula, I have a quadratic form here and I have a quadratic form here. Let's go ahead and look and see what happens. All right, so I replace the first part with a quadratic form. I replace the second part with a quadratic form. Now, as I look at this, I notice I have y transpose y, y transpose y. I can go ahead and factor. When I factor, I'm gonna get i and one over n times j on the inside. Not too shabby. All right. Well, something that comes out from all this business is that it works out, so if I, if I take a look at this formula, these two entries equal to that, if I was to move this part over to the other side, when I have these three, then I can see that y transpose i, y, is equal to what we just got a moment ago, plus the quadratic form using one over nj. So that's something that might come up later, maybe. All right, so let's take a look at some useful properties. All right, so i is equal to i minus one over nj plus one over nj. If you think about it, these two cancel out. All right, well, let's go a little bit further. i and one over nj are idempotent matrices. Can't, don't believe me, just write it down, and it'll be, it'll be pretty obvious. Now, if I have an identity matrix and I have an idempotent matrix, if I subtract, then I'm going to get an idempotent matrix. 
So I minus one over NJ is also idempotent. Now there's something else going on here. I minus one over NJ times one over NJ is equal to the zero matrix. Now, how do we show that? Well, if I distribute the one over NJ to the I, I get one over NJ. If I distribute the one over NJ to one over NJ, that's idempotent, so I get one over NJ. Again, the subtraction, it's gone, it's good. Okay, all right, now, as we go, keep going on to this, it's gonna get thick suddenly. It's, this is gonna get start, start getting like juicy. This is when the course really takes an interesting, exciting turn, and I'm, I'm pumped up for the rest of the semester. All right, so, oh, here's a proposition. And we'll come to this maybe next time, the time after, something like that. But in an upcoming video, we'll work out all these details. If y sub i is iid uh, normal, uh, mean zero, and uh, you know we have a constant variance for all i, then the, the, the ratio that I get from the sum of square deviations divided by the variance is gonna, will give me independent chi-squared variables and also n times y bar squared divided by the variance will also give me an independent uh, chi-squared. And we're gonna be using quadratic forms to get, that, get those results. All right, so now let's take a look at the mean and variance of quadratic forms. Okay, so let's say that y is a random vector and we know the expected value and we know the covariance and we're going to go ahead and say that all of the – do I need that, need that assumption? No I, no, I don't. All right. I got confused for a moment. So we have a random vector, and we're not making a statement about its distribution except for we know the distribution of each individual – or we know the mean of each individual entry, and we know the covariance for uh, – each pair of entries and we know the variance. And we're gonna go ahead and say that A is a symmetric constant matrix. Then the expected value of the quadratic form is the trace of A times sigma plus mu transpose A mu. Now something to point out at this point. Okay, if I looked at just this part, if I was to say Y transpose A Y, and I said expected value, you would like, it, it would be natural to think that this might be in play, but it, it's in play, but that's not the correct solution. There's more to it. There's more going on. So this part is not enough. Notice that there's something else tacked on. All right, so let's go ahead and let's do the proof. First and foremost, we need to remember something. We need to remember that sigma is equal to the expected value of y times y transpose minus mu times mu transpose. Okay, well, if I rewrite this equation in another way, I can see that the expected value of y transpose, or okay, this transpose is in the wrong spot. Please correct your notes. This transpose is in the wrong spot because this, this does not make sense in terms of dimension. All right, the expected value of y times y transpose is equal to sigma plus mu times mu transpose. Okay, now, All right, now let's take a look at this. What type of thing do I get back from this, from this quadratic form? Well, y transpose, so y is n by one, or sorry, it's p by one. So when I take transpose, it's one by p. A is p by p, and y is p by one. When I do the matrix multiplication, this is a one by one. That's better known as a scalar. So when I take its expected value, and I'm going to be taking the expected value of a scalar. Now, something to realize is that as a matrix, if I take the trace, it's equal to its own trace automatically. That's interesting. So if I take this, it's automatically equal to its trace. Now, what is like a huge property for us dealing with the trace? 
that huge property is that we have uh, that we can switch the order of matrices as long as the multiplication is defined. That's a big deal for us. And we're going to use it right here, right now. So the, remember, the trace of A times B is equal to the trace of B times A. All right, so I know that my quadratic form is equal to the trace of itself. And I'm going to go ahead and use the associative property of matrix multiplication, but parenthesis here. And I'm going to use the inside commutative property of trace to switch the order of this. So I'm going to go AY times A transpose. Okay, well, let's keep on going. So when I take the expected value of both sides of this equation, the expected value of my quadratic form is equal to the expected value of the trace of A times Y, Y transpose. Okay, now if you remember that the trace and the expected value operators, we can switch orders on them freely on this. This was from uh, the chapter two. So I can switch the order of the trace and the expected value. Okay, now when I get to this point, I know that A is a constant. A is a constant means I can factor it out. Like everything is just kind of flowing on this proof. The A can just be factored out. So I go ahead and factor it out. So I have the trace of A times the expected value of Y times Y transpose. Well, didn't we just look at that? Didn't we just see that this is equal to sigma plus mu mu transpose? Yes, yes we did. So I'm gonna replace this with sigma plus mu mu transpose. Now, what am I gonna do with the A at this point? I'm going to distribute. Boom, I've got it. All right, now, remember that if I take the trace of a sum, that's equal to the sum of the traces. That comes very, very clearly because it traces the sum of the, di the diagonals. So the trace of the sum is equal to the sum of the traces. Okay, now when I get down to here, I notice that I've got A mu mu transpose, right? I can switch the order once again. I'm using that commutative property within the trace function. And I can, I take this and I switch the order. All right, well, what type of thing do I get from mu transpose A mu? Well, that's a scalar, one entry. So do I need trace on there? Mm -mm. It's equal to itself, so I just drop it. I drop it like it's hot. And so now at this point, I leave this alone and I get the result. Not too shabby. Now something that we need to remember is that the expected value of the quadratic form is equal to you know, the expected value of the vector, then the matrix expected value of the, vec of the vector, plus this trace aspect between the constant vector and the sigma. Okay, so now something that would be kind of nice to look at is what if A is the identity matrix? Well, in that case, we would be getting the expected value of Y transpose Y will be equal to mu transpose mu plus the trace of our covariance matrix. The trace of the covariance matrix is the variance entries. So we get a nice result out of this. Something else to point out from this is that this expected value is not equal to what you what someone would naively pick as being the, the expected value. There's more junk going on because of this trace business. So unless the trace is equal to zero, we do not have equality. I'm gonna turn on the lights because it, it's getting dark all of a sudden. All right, so that's a little bit better. It's not Halloween yet, it don't need to be dark. All right, so let's go ahead and let's look at an example. Let's do something interesting, something fun and exciting. So let's go ahead and take a look at 
the S squared formula, the one that we're like super familiar with at this point, we learned it in introductory statistics. Now we know that the numerator of this has a quadratic form and we already worked it out. Nice, nice. Okay, so let's go ahead and assume that the y's are independent. We have constant expected values and we have constant variance. Okay, well, if I think about this, I can represent mu as the constant value times j vector. Sigma, well, we have independence, right? Independence means the covariance is equal to zero. So that means I only have diagonal entries on my sigma. We have constant variance. Therefore, it's, the, it's gonna be the same value on the diagonal, which means it's the identity matrix times that constant. Okay, well, so if I look at this, if I wanna figure out the expected value of the sum of square deviation, what I'm going to do, I say that this is the expected value of the quadratic form I've worked out. Well, we just worked out a formula for this, right? So let's go ahead and apply it. Let's take the trace of A times sigma plus mu with the A matrix quadratic form. Okay, so when I do this, let's think about what happens. So this is a constant. Multiplying by a constant, I can factor that out. Boom, I put that here. Multiplying by the I, the I matrix doesn't change anything, so th this effectively isn't there. So I'm just left with this business. Okay, okay. Now, over here, this, I replace the mu vector with scalar mu times the J vector. All right, things are looking good. Now when I get over to here, well, this is a constant matrix. It, well, not, it's not quite constant. It's either uh, negative one over N on, off the diagonal, and it's one minus one over N on the diagonal. Well, I'm taking the trace, right? So the trace of this is gonna be one minus one over N on, for every single entry. So I know I need to add this up. Same thing, one minus one over N n times is n times one minus one over n. Okay, so here the trace becomes n times one minus one over n. Let's keep on going. Well, how, what can I do with this? Well, I notice that I've got, the G, I've got a bunch of j's, right? And this is the same as uh, j vector times j vector transpose, right? Okay, so if I pause for a moment, I know that I could distribute J transpose to both of these. I could, trans I could uh, uh, distribute this J vector to both of these. So I'll have J transpose I times J. So that's gonna be uh, J transpose J. Now I've got negative one over N. All right, well, this is gonna be J transpose but then it's gonna be J, J transpose for the capital J. So the capital J gives me vector J, vector J transpose. I'm multiplying over here by on the left by vector J transpose. I multiply on the right by vector J, and that gives me this beautiful thing. Okay, so things are starting to come together. Oh, also the mu's come out front. Now, let's think about what we've got for a moment. I've got the dot product of the one vector. So that's one times one plus one times one plus one times one a bunch of times. How many times? N. Boom, we got that. Now here, when I take J, J transpose, that's going to be N, correct? And so that's going to be a constant value coming from here. That's going to be a constant N. If it's constant, I can pull it out front. Now, then I'm left with J transpose of J, which is going to add up to N, so I get N minus 1 over N, N squared. Lo and behold, I get 0 on this part. I get sigma squared times N minus 1. And so now, if I think about it, if I want to take the expected value of S squared, it's the expected value here, and which is gonna be sigma squared n minus one, divide by the n minus one, boom, 
we have that the expected value of S squared is an unbiased estimator of sample variance. Now, something to notice about this, we didn't actually assume the distribution. We actually, the only thing that we assumed on this was that we had independence, constant mean, constant variance. We did not make any assumption about the underlying distribution. In fact, if you look at this, we could have different, we could have different uh, distributions for each entry. It just has to have same mean, same variance, independence. Kind of a powerful result. Uh, and, you know, like once you have quadratic forms, this is a rather direct way to compute this compared to the techniques that you had to do like in stat theory. All right, now here we are gonna need to roll up our sleeves. We need to roll up our sleeves for the rest of this video because it gets juicy and it gets good. All right, if Y is a uh, normal uh, vector, length P uh, with a mean mu vector and a sigma matrix for the covariance, we have independence and A is constant symmetric, then the moment generating function, do I need a oh. um, Then the moment generating function of the quadratic form is going to be the determinant. Remember the absolute value bars here are determinant, I minus two T A sigma, and then it's negative square root. Remember positive definite matrices always have a square root, times E to the power of negative mu transpose, then I minus this, the inverse of this internal matrix, sigma uh, inverse times mu divided by two. Okay, this one's gonna be a doozy. Moment generating function, what is a moment generating function? I take the variable, I multiply by t, take the expected value. Okay, so that gets us to here. Now I know the density, right? So once I know the density, I go ahead and multiply by the kernel, I do integration. So I take this, I multiply by the density. So remember, we're dealing in uh, multivariate normal, so this is going to be my density. Okay, so what I want to do, I want to really, I want to only look at the exponent on this. I don't want to worry about all the other junk that's going on. If I take a look and I expand this out, I take the time to expand this out and I distribute. The first thing I need to do, I distribute the transpose to these vectors and then I can distribute so that I have four terms in here. Now, you'll notice that we'll have some middle terms. Those middle terms, because uh, they're actually uh, scalar values after I do the multiplication, are going to have, uh, are going to collapse down. And you'll notice that here, this is the middle term. We're gonna have uh, two versions of this, this version and we're gonna have it, the transpose of it will appear when I do the uh, distribution. And since I've got two versions of it, when I multiply by the one half, that's gonna uh, cancel with the two. Okay, so now this is the exponent of the MGF, or oh, sorry, of, of E over here. Now, what I want to do is I've got this over here, and I've got this business, right? And I've got E, which means I add them inside the exponent. So I'm gonna take this T times quadratic form, and I need to add it to this, which is the same as that. Okay, so I noticed that I've got this whole thing. I've got this up here. I see I've got, oh, there should be a transpose here. Y, tra uh, uh, y transpose A Y, and I have Y transpose uh, sigma inverse y. So I see that I've got y's on both of these terms. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, factor. All right, so when I get the y factor, I get, in, con, I get the quadratic form of t times a minus one half sigma inverse, and then I have the mu transpose sigma inverse y minus one half conjugate form of mu and sigma inverse. Okay. Well, let's take a look. Let's see what we can do with this. All 
All right, this part stays the same. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, to here I'm going to multiply and divide by two, so I have the same thing. Now, over here, what I want to do, I want to factor out one half sigma inverse. From here, I want to factor out one half sigma inverse. So when I factor out a half, there's no one half here, right? So to counteract that factoring, I multiply by two. I want to factor out sigma inverse from here, but I also want to factor out sigma inverse here. There's no sigma inverse, so I put a sigma right there to counteract the factorization. That way everything stays the same. Okay, so now what I want to do, this part stays the same except I factor, or I factor out negative one half from all of these, that comes out front. Now after I factor out the negative one half, this one half comes out front. With the negative sign, the order switches right here. So I get I minus two T A sigma. Over here, I factor out the one half and the negative, factor out the one half and the negative. Boom, we've got that. Okay, so now, we need to do a little bit of matrix calculus, or it, maybe not, not so much as calculus, it's a little bit lower than that, but we're, we're thinking about uh, continuous functions. All right, if I look at this, T is a variable, and we have usually students in this class haven't really thought about it too much, but we can treat these matrices as being like constants, like in a polynomial. And, and basically what I'm doing, I'm defining things as being entry-wise polynomials to be able to do this. And this whole entry-wise polynomial aspect, if I think about continuous functions, this is entry-wise a straight line on each of the entries. All right, well, if it's a straight line, it's a polynomial of degree one, so I, ha I have continuous. All right, so if I, what that means is that I have like, I can take an open neighborhood around T equals zero. All right, now I know that when T is equal to zero, I get I. All right, when I get I, that is an invertible function. What, that's tell, what this tells us is that there, and we, uh, topology is beyond the scope of this course, but if you take a topology course, you'll find out that it works out that because uh, because we have continuity and we have a point where it's invertible, that means that there is an open neighborhood around T equals zero where uh, the where all the matrices in that open neighborhood are invertible. All right, so there exists a neighborhood around T zero such that all of these matrices are non-singular for any value of T. All right, that means I can take an inverse as long as we're not too far away from t equals zero. Okay. So what are we gonna do? Let's go ahead and set B inverse equal to this funny matrix. Now, how do we come up with this funny matrix? This part's rather obvious, right? I mean, it should seem rather intuitive. So I've got to this point. I'm gonna call this B inverse. Now, why am I choosing B inverse? Because of the whole quadratic form and normal distribution stuff. Okay, so it works out if I declare V inverse to be equal to this, this means that sigma inverse is equal to this. Multiply, multiply both sides by the inverse of the parentheses. Okay, when I do that, I'm replacing this with V inverse. I come over here and let's see. Oh, I replace sigma inverse with this. So sigma inverse gets replaced with that. I put that in here and that goes there. So I, you can see I have negative two mu and then sigma inverse and then y. When I get over here, I'm replacing sigma inverse with this part. I get that. Now, this does not look informative, right? It's a big, ugly mess. But this is good stuff, this is good stuff. What we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna say that the theta vector is equal to 
the inverse of this matrix times mu, which means that uh, theta transpose is equal to mu transpose times the inverse of that matrix. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, everywhere that I see the inverse of the matrix times mu or its transpose, I'm gonna make a substitution. So I see that I've got, I can make a substitution here. I see that I can make a substitution here. Okay, so at this point, all right, so this part stays the same. Over here, we get negative two uh, theta transpose, V inverse, V inverse is staying the same, Y vector stay, uh, stays the same. Over here, I'm replacing this part with theta transpose, V inverse mu. All right, now it, it's not really clear why I'm doing this, but it's gonna work out. Now, what we're gonna do, and this is slick, we're, uh, where we're going with this is that if I can put this into the format of a density, I know that that will integrate to one. And if I can, then I can get rid of this whole integration business. Remember, we're taking an expected value and that expected value involves an integral. I need to somehow compute that integral. Our game plan is I'm going to manipulate this so I recognize a density that integrates to one and boom, we're gonna take the coefficients. All right, so what we're gonna do at this point, and when I get to here, what did I do? Oh, okay, so what I'm going to do, I take this part right there. I want to put this in the format of like the exponent of a normal density. So remember, it's always like y minus a mean. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to convert this into y minus a mean conjugate form with v inverse. Okay, now you notice I did some, I, I tacked on thetas on the inside of here. Well, what I have to do, I have to counteract putting those in. Off, on the side, I, I, I expanded out, I worked out the details that this is equal to this uh, conjugate form of y and v inverse is equal to all of this stuff. Well, when I look at this, I notice that this cancels with that, right? The part that's underlined cancels with the part that's underlined. So this shows up here in the equation. This shows up here in the equation. This whole, this thing is equal to these three parts. This part and then that part cancel out. So this is what I've got. Now here I had a transcription error, so that's why that's all marked out, please ignore. All right, so this stays the same, that's good. Ah, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, substitute uh, mu, I'm gonna substitute theta and V inverse, that's how we defined them. And let's see what happens. All right, so what uh, V inverse is going to give me this times sigma inverse. So when I do that, this inverse sign is wrong, but the, oper I oper the operation I did is correct. So I wish I had a whiteboard, I just want like erase it. So these two, I have inverse times the matrix, which cancels out. So I'm gonna have mu and sigma inverse conjugate form right there then this stays the same, that stays the same. Almost done, almost done. Okay, so when I look at this, on this next step, all I do is I change the order of stuff. So I notice that this part when I put it over here, that's the exponent of the normal density kernel. 
And then over here, you know, when I move it around, I notice that's a constant with respect to y. It's a constant with respect to y it means I can factor out that integral. And this is part of the density of the normal of a multivariate normal distribution. Therefore, I if I get pick the right constants, I can go ahead and integrate that out, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All right, so if I I would go ahead and I just brute force write all this out. And if I just start working on this, I see that all right, this part is that exponent we talked about. These two are constants with respect to y. What I'm going to do is I take the part over here that connects with here to make it into a density. You see this? Now, these are constants with respect to y. It means I can factor it out of the integral and I go ahead and move this part out of the fraction, I know that this integrates to one because it's a density. Boom, check that out. All of that cancels, all, so all of this is just one. All of this is left. Now what I have to do, I just start going through and I start doing the substitutions like I did with B inverse and the sigma inverse. If I take my time and I just plug and chug and it just takes, you know, just work it through, we end up getting the result that we want. All right, so if y is multivariate normal, then, or so for our next theorem, then the variance of the conjugate form is two times the trace of a times the covariance squared plus four times mu transpose a sigma a mu. Kind of an ugly formula, but if I know a, I know sigma, I know mu, it's easy to get. All right, so how do we do this? What we're gonna do, we're going to do some, some calculus that uh, most people, I, I would say most people in the class have not actually encountered, uh, but it's, you know, so I'm using moment generating functions. Remember, if I take the second, if I take natural log of a moment generating function, take the second derivative, set, equal, set the variable equal to zero, that gives me the variance. It's a very nice property. And basically, I just plug and chug. Now, this work is just basic calculus. So you just have to go through. Uh, the product rule is kind of ugly on this because of the matrices, but it works out. The part that's kind of strange on this to get all the way through, on this part to be able to get this, you have to invoke the, uh, the formulas of the determinants using uh, uh, for traces, the formula for trace and uh, determinants using eigenvalues, and it gets rather ugly, but it works out. Right, so what we do is I'm, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff. I'm going to just hit the big stuff. I think it, you know if, if you've hung with me this far, you can get down. To, you can go from the beginning down to this part, but it gets a little bit unusual. Okay, so here. To be able to get at this determinant of C, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the, uh, the formula for uh, its eigenvalues, and I'm going and use the eigenvalue formula of determinant. If I expand this out, I'm going to get a pretty, uh, you know, a pretty decent degree uh, polynomial. It's going to be a, a degree P polynomial to be exact. Now, something about this. Well, if I'm working close to zero, for all practical purposes, I can disregard the higher order of terms. And when I say higher order, I mean power of t. So what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to ignore all of the power, all the terms that have a t with a power greater than two. Why am I doing that? So remember that like if I have just like one, that's going to correspond to expected value. Power of one will correspond to expected value. Uh, power of two will uh, connect to um, you know, the variance, that's all I want. All I want is variance, so I'm not going to dig in any further. Okay, so when I get to this point, I've got higher order terms. They're all degree three or degree three, four, five, six, all the way up to P. When I take the derivative and set equal to zero, it's going to be equal to zero, so I don't need to worry about it. So when I take the derivative, the first derivative, well, that dis the one disappears, and then I have the constant. 
And then when I take the derivative with respect to t here, I get the eight. And so when I take the second derivative, I get eight times the sum of different uh, eigenvalues. So now well, all I need to do is start plugging in, I need to plug in zero. There's a lot of stuff to this. So this part gets thrown in off of the trace formula for eigenvalues. This gets thrown in for that second derivative. And then I just need to start working with it. And we need to remember that the, the, if I take the square of the trace, it's equal to the uh, uh, trace of the squared matrix plus two times the product of different eigenvalues. And we've got, now that is a lot to look at. So please take your time, please dig into this. A lot of stuff went on in this. Um, let me know if you need help, take care and goodbye.